Now our minds were made up. When we loaded our scrap iron on Japanese ships, our citizens protested. Let Mr. Atchison, Assistant Secretary of State, tell us the inside of the story. So until the middle of 1940, the restriction of exports to Japan took the form of moral embargoes of aeroplanes and direct munitions. Then Congress passed the Export Control Act and increasing cutoffs of scrap iron, aviation gasoline, and other strategic items followed. Exports were curtailed to the limit which those responsible for our defense were willing to risk. It was a fearful responsibility. On one side was the possibility, in fact the probability, that one day these materials might be used against us. On the other side was the possibility, in fact the probability, that to cut them off would provoke an attack which we were not then prepared to resist. Finally, in the summer of 1941, as it became clear that Japan was turning her back upon every possibility of reconciliation and adjustment and was determined upon her great gamble of conquest, all exports ceased. On April 9, 1940, the leaders of Nazi Germany shifted their war machine into high gear. They overran into Denmark. They smashed into Norway. On May the 10th, 1940, they blitzed into Holland and Belgium. The Nazis are marching ahead at the fastest speed a conquering army has moved in all history. All roads in France are choked with slow-moving masses of refugees. Nazi Stuka dive bombers are scraping and bombing thousands of helpless women and children. Mr. Kelsenborn. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, it seems clearly apparent that the first great phase of the war in the West has been won by Germany. The army of French and British has made a valiant battle in its effort to retreat to Dunkirk, where there is some slight chance that some part of it can be evacuated. Adolf Hitler's mechanized forces are racing toward Paris as French resistance collapses. On this 10th day of June, 1940, the hand that held the dagger has struck it into the back of its neighbor. This is William L. Shirer speaking from the forest of Compiègne, where Adolf Hitler today is handing his armistice terms to France. It is 3.15 p.m. Adolf Hitler strides slowly toward the little clearing. I can see his face, his grave, solemn, yet brimming with revenge. Off to one side is a large statue of Marshal Foch. Hitler does not appear to see it. Now we see the French walking down the avenue, led by General Hunsinger. Hitler and the other German leaders rise as the French enter. General Kaido reads the preamble to the German armistice terms. This whole ceremony is over in a quarter of an hour. The last time I saw Paris, her heart was warm and gay. I heard the laughter of her heart in every street cafe. The last time I saw Paris, her trees were dressed for spring, and lovers walked beneath those trees, and birds found songs to sing. I dodged the same old taxi cabs that I had dodged for years. The chorus of the squeaky horns was music to my ears. The last time I saw Paris, her heart was warm and gay. No matter how they chose. Conquering armies now stood on the shores of the Atlantic. Fire! The danger was suddenly close. Countries conquered by the Nazis had possessions outside of Europe. Some of these possessions are in America. 
Would the Nazis demand the French naval units at Martinique? Would the Nazis move into the Dutch oil fields at Curaçao? Would the Nazis seize the French naval base at Dakar for invasion of South America? Already in Brazil, there were over one million Germans who lived exactly as they did in Germany. 1,200 German schools with Nazi textbooks and Nazi teachers. Nazi newspapers. Hermann Goering glider clubs had been established. Also in Brazil, there were 260,000 Japanese taking orders from Japan. In Ecuador, within easy bombing range of the Panama Canal, German airlines had been established. German pilots were reserve officers of the Luftwaffe. The German transport planes had bomb racks already built in. In Argentina, German athletic clubs, similar to the Hitler Youth Movement, had been organized exclusively for Germans. Here was a fifth column ready to take over. In Havana, we met with 20 other American republics. There must not be a shadow of a doubt anywhere as to the determination of the American nations not to permit the invasion of their hemisphere by the armed forces of any power or any possible combination of powers. 20 American nations stood firm. The Americas would not allow any European colony in this hemisphere to be transferred to a non-American power. We said, keep out. We meant it. We must increase production facilities for everything needed for the Army and Navy for national defense. I believe that this nation should plan at this time a program that will provide us with 50,000 military and naval planes. To protect our shores, we authorized construction of a two-ocean navy, the greatest the world has ever known. At least it would be the greatest navy when completed in 1944. But then, in 1940, it was only a paper navy. Our fighting forces at that time consisted of an army of 187,000 men, a navy of 120,000, and this dot was the Air Corps, 22,387 strong. All told, 330,000 men. We had makeshift supplies, makeshift equipment, stovepipes for cannon, bags of flour for bombs, and trucks were labeled tanks. <laughs> Our infantry had exactly 488 machine guns. We possessed 235 pieces of field artillery, 10 light, and 18 medium tanks. That was the army of the United States in May 1940, the month in which the Nazis overran France. So we called our Minutemen, the National Guards of the 48 states, and placed them into federal service. And most important, Congress passed the Selective Service Act. For the first time in our history, we began mobilizing an army while still at peace. The first number is serial number 158. This is the army, Mr. Jones. The second number, which has just been drawn, is 192. This is the army, Mr. Green. We like the barracks like the Queen. You had a house made to clean your floor, but she won't help you out anymore. Do what the new birds command. They're in the army and out in the van. It wasn't too soon. Time was running out. The Nazis had begun their shattering blitz on Britain. Hello, America. This is Edward Murrow speaking from London. 
There were more German planes over the coast of Britain today than at any time since the war began. Anti-aircraft guns were in action along the southeast coast today. Back on Main Street, USA. Daily, we followed Britain's life struggle. For if Britain died, we would be in grave peril. Our first line of defense in the Atlantic, the British fleet, might go to Nazi Germany. We would be unprotected, our shores, our people, our homes in danger. Britain must not fall. In our harbors, idle and rotting, lay ancient destroyers. They had been built for World War I, but this was World War II, and this gave us an idea. Fifty tired, over-aged destroyers were revitalized, transferred to Great Britain.